the US versus Iran, what now? Big title there. So uh, we've got great hopes for our two guests to, to enlighten us on what's going on between Iran and, and, and the US at the moment. Our two guests today are Knut Wicke. He's professor at, uh, uh, of history at the University of Bergen, and he's been focusing on um, Islamic law and the history of, of uh, Islam and many other topics uh, of concern to the region. Um, our second guest is the first time we're here, I think, uh, Gilda Sidigi. She is a researcher uh, at the Western Norway Research Institute, or Westlandsforskning. Uh, she wrote her PhD with the title Politicization of Grievable Lives in Iranian Facebook Pages, if I'm not mistaken. So she's an expert on social movements and will be very interested to hear about um, what goes on in terms of uh, social movements and, and, and protests at the popular, le popular level in, in Iran these days. Um, now, I'd like to do it the way we normally do it here. Uh, we'll talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll leave the last 15 minutes or so for, for questions from the audience. So make a mental note of any questions you uh, that pop up during the, the conversation and we'll, we'll get right to them uh, at the end. Uh, I think we need to start by, by looking back a little bit, Knut, because uh, the, the last or the first two weeks, I would say, of the new decade has been quite eventful in terms of the relationship between the US and Iran. But this uh, hostility or the relationship between them has not been friendly in, in decades, really. And if you look at the neighbors uh, that surround our, uh, Iran, several of them are, are US allies. And it's not always obvious to us why it is Iran that's been depicted as the sort of the axis of evil, to use uh, George Bush's words. Can you take us back a little bit and remind us where this, this whole problematic uh, relationship starts? Uh, well, I don't think it's turned on, but I guess you can hear me anyway. Um, you must, uh, we should distinguish between two different uh, interlocking types of contradiction here. Uh, on the one hand, on the one hand, you have what we might call the international or the global one mm -hmm. between the United States and, uh, and Iran. And that, okay. And I don't think anybody can hear it still, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that goes back, uh, of course, and to the uh, to the uh, Re Islamic Revolution in 1979, uh, which has clearly is remembered at least in some circles in uh, in the United States as a a, um, a loss of face. And the figure 52 is important here. That uh, when Trump, as we will get to, threatened to. Uh, dropped 52 bombs on Iran recently. It was one for each of the two, uh, 52 hostages that was held in, uh, in the US Embassy in Tehran in 1979-80. So that is been, hasn't been there always. It's been there only since the fall of the Shah. And then we have the other, which is more geographic and regional, and which has been kind of been there always. And that is between Iran and whoever is on top in the Arab world. Um, so after, again, the same thing happened in the uh, late 70s, that Egypt uh, stepped down from the position as leader of the Arab world by signing the Camp David uh, agreement with Israel and uh, uh, therefore was kicked out of the leadership of the Arab League. It allowed kind of the throne, the throne of the leadership of the Arab world Vacant, and Saddam Hussein and Iraq wanted to uh, to um, take on that throne, and they did it by creating a contradiction to Iran and saying and the revolution, the Shiite revolution, the Islamic revolution, and to defend Arabs against Iran. Uh, when that failed with the war in uh, eighty to eighty eight. 
then uh, and Iran and Saddam, uh, Iraq and Saddam uh, disappeared with uh, the uh, American invasion, 2003. Then it has recently become more and more Saudi Arabia, which has tried to say, okay, now is our turn, at least after the change of leadership uh, and the new and more aggressive uh, policies of the Crown Prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, two or three years ago. Uh, so that is kind of being the question of who dominates, who dominates the Persian Gulf area. And here it is important, why is Iran, one, it is not an Arab country, it is, it sees itself as different, but also, and this, I hopefully nobody here, but in the general public, people tend to confuse Iraq and Iran. Uh, because there is only one you know, letter different. So even I tend to say Iraq when I mean Iran and so on. And uh, so uh, many in the West, they think that uh, Iraq, Iran is going to be a pushover like Iraq was in, uh, in 2003. But Iran is, I'm sure Gilda is happy to agree with me there, it's a totally different country. Uh, Iran has 80 million inhabitants, the same as uh, Germany. It, has, uh, it is a modern country with much more to a large, much larger degree than the Arab countries, well-developed uh, uh, industry, economy, uh, in addition to, to the oil, which also, of course, is a great wealth, and uh, a large military. And it also it has been through a very long and grueling war with Iraq in the 1980s, still within memory. So it is also trained to war. So Iran is really a country which kind of balances the Eastern Arab world by all by itself. And that is why it has been kind of seen as a challenger or as a threat to anybody, non-Iran, who thinks they want to, um, that they uh, could be a candidate to dominate this, uh, this region. So that is a kind of uh, a thing which doesn't really have anything to do with religion, although they use a religious difference. Um, and it has more to do with the regional power, who's going to dominate. And so that goes back to, until before the Shah. The Shah before, when the Shah was there, you still had the competition between Iraq and Iran, only then Iran was pro-Western and Iraq was pro-Soviet. Um, uh, uh, pro and uh, now so it is switched around uh, a, a little, uh, being anti-US in Iran and pro-US in Saudis. But it is still the same in a kind of historic geographic contradiction between the two. But also in, in, in Iran, Gilda, I would say the, the rhetoric has been quite harsh uh, coming from at least from, from clerics and from the regime that, you know, they d tend to depict um, the U.S. as sort of the great Satan. Is that sort of animosity also felt on uh, among ordinary Iranians or, or how do you sort of see the U.S. there yeah. on that level? Mm. Uh, you can see it uh, differently. I don't know if you can hear me well. Uh, okay, that's good. Um, uh, you can see it. Um, you can see U.S. both as a saver mm. among Iranians and also as an enemy. So, uh, you, for example, um, we had demonstrations uh, in Iran uh, last days, and one of the slogans in the that you hear in Iran is that um, uh, um, why Iranians uh, you have uh, seated still uh, you don't uh, rise up. Uh, you are your own saver. And that comes in contradiction with earlier slogans that used to chant for Obama mm -hmm. to do something. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's a difference that we see. And uh, then you have um, uh, demonstrations that are organized by the government. And mm -hmm. then you see people chant uh, down to uh, the US, for example. Then. Mm. So the, the, the harsh rhetoric is not sort of shared or uh, those feelings are not shared by, by, by most Iranians. Uh, at least it's not uh, homogenic. It's not like homogenic that. at mm. all. And, uh, but another, another aspect that I forgot to say is uh, that many younger generation that or the generation that are born after Islamic Republic is that uh, that we we grew up with uh, 
history of imperialism and uh, history of what the U.S. and uh, other Western countries have done in the in the region. So that's a very basic information, or at least some of the public is also propaganda, but but uh, at least that's many take it for granted. And when uh, when we many uh, the youth generation they face sanctions, they see. Um, uh, authoritarian regime in Iran and sanctions in other hand. So that's the, they are in between two harsh um, uh, politics and they are in, in many ways against both or they feel they are uh, you know, trapped between two uh, difficult uh, uh, pol politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not hegemonic at all. But uh, I, will, I, will, I won't say that the group that feel uh, sanctions are uh, uh, making their life difficult in many different ways, um, uh, especially in finding jobs and uh, because there are so many, uh, there have been so many problems uh, related to uh, industry that still can, and industries can still function in Iran. Um, and many um, have had problems uh, with finding job um, and uh, be independent mm -hmm. as uh, young uh, people, uh, but I won't say that they are. They share the same angle or perspective with the government, but mm -hmm. they are they 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 criticize the U.S. but not in the same way. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, we have to talk about the assassination of, of General uh, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the um, Revolutionary Guards Quds Force. Um, uh, could you just start off by saying a little bit, uh, maybe, uh, Knut, about who was he sort of in the region? I mean, what did he represent in the, in the region? Why well, was he so important? Uh, well, he was a symbol. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's a bit of a disagreement about who uh, created that symbol. Some say that uh, it is actually Israel and the Americans who wanted to focus on Soleimani and or Soleimani, uh, <laughs> to be the person name, uh, um, to uh, um, as a kind of the evil guy, the guy to take out, the guy to who dominates everything. But it came he. And he was, of course, a, an actual leader, a real leader of um, the uh, of the activities of um, Iranian interests, military interests uh, in uh, Iraq and in Syria and elsewhere. Uh, but of course, he was part of a, a policy which Iranian regime and Iran, Iranian military and the Revolutionary Guard in particular. Was uh, was behind, so it wasn't like he w really was the one who set, you know, the America. Now they say, well, uh, what is what the administration says? Uh, there were plans to bomb these four embassies. This is what Trump is saying, and everybody says which embassies. We've never heard about this, and so on. But anyway, that now that we've killed him, there won't be any attacks on these embassies because he was the one who was, you know, pulling all the strings by himself. That, of course, is, uh, is political rhetoric. Mm. Um, s but it kind of backfired because when his adversaries made him the kind of epitome, the kind of symbol of Iranian strength, of course, Iranians also discovered that and saw him as a symbol of uh, Iranian strength and of... Uh, of uh, its position in uh, in the world. Of course, Iran Iranians have a certain fairly justified uh, view of themselves as being surrounded by people who are not very friendly to them. It's the United States, the Arabs, Europeans. Okay, they are kind of friendly, more or less, but they are you know uh, powerless, and so that is kind of evidently a situation which favors the creation of something that says, well, we aren't that alone. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a certain presence. And Soleimani then became the kind of symbol of, uh, of um, self-worth of Iran in the region. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Would you agree on that, uh, Gilda? Uh, yes. Uh, the day that uh, he was uh, killed, uh, it, there was so much conflict on Iranian uh, online space. Uh, on uh, Instagram and many different types of uh, social media. And I believe in every single house in Iran because uh, the conflict was uh, who that person was. And um, still there are conflicts on uh, who Soleimani uh, was uh, for Iranians. Uh, one part of the conflict is that uh, many believe that, uh, or the way he was presented to Iranians, uh, that uh, he, uh, if he was not there, Iran would be uh, invaded by uh, by Daesh. So uh, he was kind of hero for many that he stopped Daesh uh, to uh, to move toward Iranian border. Or, uh, take over it's because it's many many um, many times people exaggerate in order to make the the point that how important he uh, he was for Iran, and that the, his importance is very much related to uh, national safety and uh, security. So uh, he when people that uh, mourn for him, they often say that we wouldn't have any security today if he was not uh, there in uh, in the region uh, so but then you see actually something that is interesting to dig into because uh, you know th those people that argue from that point uh, they know that uh, Soleimani created kind of safety on the basis of making war and conflict and suffering for many others in the region. Uh, so that argument comes from the position that our safety and our blood is more important than others. So th that has been criticized by other Iranians, that we cannot accept that kind of nationalism, that, uh, that, uh, that accept suffering of others in the region. Uh, and those have uh, online have been cr uh, tried to re uh, remind people that who, what kind of uh, conflict and violence uh, Soleimani has been part of, and what uh, what he has done in the in the region. Uh, so we have, but then we have demonstrations again in the last days uh, that shows that in Iran uh, many are um, many that couldn't have a uh, possibility to show that they see uh, Soleimani as a, uh, as a person that is, uh, has been violent, mm -hmm. uh, haven't had the space, uh, and that those people come to demonstrations and uh, take off his pictures in the streets or burn the pictures or say slogans that shows, for example, uh, Soleimani is a, uh, is a, is a murder. So that's, uh, you, uh, but if you think about one week ago, then we saw something very differently. Mm -hmm. In one week ago, uh, uh, many came to, to the streets to, uh, to show their grief and uh, to follow him or show the respect when he was uh, moving from uh, border Iran Iraq to Tehran to Kerman when uh, he was from and buried there and many people actually died uh, f uh, the uh, official uh, number says that 56 people died uh, during uh, the ceremony uh, in that city uh, and they died because there was too many, uh, too many people in very uh, small space. Uh, so uh, you you see that uh, he 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 is the point. Uh, he was very much symbol, uh, of, uh, symbol inside Iran. But now today, is that symbol has become the point many uh, can criticize. Iran's uh, Iran's um, politic mm. in the region. 
uh, and also inside Iran. Because one another issue in Iran that uh, make a lot of conflict is that how much he was involved in the um, uh, in uh, involved in cracking down the uh, the demonstrations that uh, was in 2000 in uh, November. Uh, 2019, mm. and um, there the has not been any official numbers how many people were killed. Uh, Amnesty International says that uh, more than 300 people were killed during one week. Uh, Kalame is a website that was ma uh, made uh, during 2009, uh, um, 2009 um, protests, uh, mostly um, reformist people. Uh, run that group. Uh, they say that uh, more than 600 were killed, and uh, another official and uh, unofficial uh, number is more than uh, 1,500. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm, there have been so much pressure to find out how many people, mm -hmm. uh, if uh, they can find out how many people were killed, and but uh, there, there there is no number. But then people ask, because he was part of SEPA, or uh, is called the Revolution Guard, uh, uh, he, he was also involved in mm -hmm. those kind of um, uh, suppression inside Iran. So it's not hegemonic. Mm. <laughs> interesting. So it's, in, if you can add, it's interesting. <coughs> this same picture, the picture of him hanging there, can, uh, is a symbol which can be imbued with two different things. Last week, it was a symbol of Iran. Mm. And this week, it was a symbol of the regime. Mm -hmm. And how uh, anti-regime people last week went out in the streets and, uh, and uh, you know, waved his, his banner. Uh, and anti-regime people today, uh, they go out and tear down. So the question is, and I think that would be very nice for some sociologists or anthropologists can go out and see, was it actually the same people who did the same thing last week or this week? Or where we are, are we talking about two different types of anti-regime people, some who were allowed themselves to be mobilized for defense of Iran last mm. week? Mm. And uh, somebody waved some hands or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to... Or to uh, then um, use the occasion then to bring out their mm. anti-regime uh, slogans uh, um, this week. I also would like to go back to the to the uh, demonstrations, but yes, please continue. I, I would like to add something here uh, about who who were the people that grieved for uh, Soleimani in the first week. Uh, I see um, I see some tendencies there that are similar in general in Iranian uh, society. And I would, I would like to elaborate what I'm trying to say. Uh, by a couple of examples, um, uh, the day, I, I guess it was the day uh, that he was killed, uh, came out some rumors that what was actually happened, because uh, in many countries uh, that you, people don't tr uh, trust the news agencies that com then comes a lot of rumors that uh, what actually is happening in the region or in the uh, country. And uh, one of them was that uh, Iran and U the US um, actually collaborated to kill Soleimani. And uh, because uh, he was planning a coup in Iran, because he, but he had so much power both inside and outside Iran, and uh, um, he, he was a kind of, the way uh, the, the, those rumors were shared on social media showed that he was a kind of hope that could bring kind of change in, in Iran. So uh, uh, I know, then when I see that how he was grieved and how uh, the hope was not, it was not about his background, in Islamic organization and uh, his background in uh, Revolutionary Guard, but being Iranian that can uh, that can create uh, or uh, create power uh, outside Iran for Iran, and also solidarity and um, uh, decrease decrease 
uh, um, kind of um, uh, chaos situation that many people see in Iran after the sanctions, uh, the new uh, sanctions started. So uh, he was seen as a hope. Mm. And that kind of hope we see in another person or another person in Iran, uh, among Iranians, especially in slum areas when they demonstrate. And that's uh, Reza Shah and Reza Khan. When they talk about, say, uh, that uh, he, uh, God bless him, or uh, uh, one of the Sulaimans that shall come, uh, shall come back to Iran. So uh, I feel that there is a desire that uh, Ir Iranian wants, uh, at least so those who uh, saw Soleimani as a hope, they, they see a kind of, they want um, uh, a strong person that can create um, a strong uh, state, that central state, that can uh, just end all corruptions, all uh, injustice that people see inside Iran and, and uh, make Iran a power in, re in the region. So uh, that's, uh, that's very important because I, I don't see that necessarily these people are different from those who, for example, say, chant for Reza Shah, though they are very different people, but the desire is very similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And talking about Iranian power, I mean, the retaliation of the, of the uh, assassination was announced very, um, yeah, using big words. But so far, uh, the attacks that were carried out on the on the U.S. bases didn't really kill a single American. Um, and by many, even in the West, they were considered like reasonable. That this is a reasonable type of, uh, of retaliation. Uh, you go for the people who you assume actually carried out the killing. Uh, so why hasn't the reaction been more fierce? That's can it maybe. Uh, <coughs> um, well, they said. Well, they were said many things, but uh, there was said or even before and that the, it should be a measured response, mm -hmm. proportionate response, to which, of course, Trump then uh, said that I will be use disproportionate response. So there are two ways. One is one, two ways to, of saying this. One is, uh, which maybe we combine, one is that they actually were like everybody, I mean, West and East and Arabs, allies and everybody, nobody really knows what goes, in, goes on in the bedroom and bathroom of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so that there was a, an actual fear that a stronger response, particularly the one which killed Americans, which is the kind of red line that Trump has uh, used, uh, that would, he would actually uh, do something uh, like what he said like really go to war in Iran because there doesn't seem to be anybody in the US who can stop him if he just wants to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so that they, in kind of Trump uh, on his side then uh, bluffed and said, uh, if you do it, if you do something strong then, and uh, Iran in this case caved, uh, opposite of what it was happened, I think maybe we we will not talk about it later, but what has happened last year was a kind of Iran, if they did actually bomb the Saudi, um, or were behind the bombing of the Saudi oil facilities last year, and Saudis expected the US to respond, and the US did nothing. So that was Iran calling uh, the US bluff, and US caving, now it was the other way around. Now, uh, th Trump threatened with war, and... Uh, Iran responded by not doing anything. But uh, there's also this uh, idea that they don't really want a war because they didn't really want escalation. This was something that the US, and not the US, Trump, I mean, must say that this was not US policy, it was Trump policy. Mm. Uh, that uh, uh, they were the one, only ones pushing now for a conflict and Iran didn't really want a conflict even though they wanted to, uh, you know, take care of the uh, the great popular mobilization for revenge, uh, for the killing. Mm. And so they did something which they then could present partly by exaggerating the, uh, the strength to the Iranian public. So they kind of saved face. 
but at the same time they stopped the uh, actual danger of, of, of war. Mm. Uh, so it was not just called it, not just caving, but it was in fact Iranian interests. Mm. And then came the the downing of the Ukrainian pass- passenger jet. Um, did this play a role in this? You think or? And, and what was the reactions in, in, in Iran to that? What has the reactions been? Yeah. Uh, I need to go back mm-hmm. in time to, to say a little bit about why the reaction is the way it is now. Um, uh, and I would like to go back to t- 2009, um, the uprising mm. uh, that I was very interested in uh, in 2009. And many people probably ha- heard about the Green Movement. And at that time, uh, uh, the uprising uh, used the conflict between conservatives and uh, reformists in Iran to ask for uh, greater uh, um, rights and uh, uh, freedom of speech and uh, and uh, more uh, more. Uh, yeah, freedom in uh, political space uh, in general. Uh, but as uh, time passed since 2009, uh, many things have happened in, in Iran. One is that reformists, uh, they, don't, uh, they, they, they are not a, a political power that can challenge uh, conservatives in Iran and they have lost their uh, political uh, position, and therefore uh, people don't use the, the space that that kind of co- conflict can, can create. Uh, then we have had uh, a lot of uh, uh, many cases about uh, uh, corruption came out, and uh, uh, corruptions, uh, uh, huge corruptions uh, that many people believe uh, government has hand in it, and uh, and gov- uh, and the head of just justice cannot cannot do much about the corruptions that is quite obvious uh, in the society. Uh, then we have sanctions that uh, create uh, difficult many difficulties in Iran. Uh, so they. Uh, there have been m- many moments that uh, that uh, people start thinking and reflecting on uh, so what we can do in a situation that there is no power inside the, f- the frame that Islamic Republic of Iran has created in order to challenge the po- uh, those uh, that are in power. Uh, uh, then... Uh, we have seen different type of protests since, since 2009. Um, uh, and in recent years, we have seen uh, continuity of um, protests against corruption, um, sometimes weekly in different parts of Iran. We have seen protests um, organized by um, uh, those who fight for labor rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have been many have been arrested and are in jail. Uh, then we have also um, those who lost their uh, money in uh, in banks because there have been uh, corruption related to that. So we have that kind of protest. Then we have a new type of protest that started in uh, in January 2018. And uh, there's a belief that that, that kind of uh, protest existed before, but now they are more obvious to the rest of people. And the, that's the um, protest of uh, slum areas. Uh, people um, uh, that are uh, in a poor, uh, they are poor, uh, they cannot come out of the, the poverty. Though they take uh, education, good education, but they cannot get job. They need transport to to come to another place to get to find job. So mm, then we have seen the new uh, protests uh, in uh, November 2019 that uh, came out of its portion. So it it was in around 200 uh, towns and cities in Iran, and uh, it was a huge protest and huge 
crack down. In a, in a way, that's, uh, I don't know if you have heard about that, but the internet was shut down for several days and it was not possible to find out what is happening uh, inside Iran. Uh, and when people got internet again, then came out all videos from the streets and showed uh, how awful the situation was for people that took part in the demonstration in Iran. Uh, but one of the things that um, uh, we have seen and uh, in, in Iran is that those who took part in uh, demonstrations um, in Shalom areas, uh, people used to say that there are people that you don't see it in everyday life. So those, in a, there are invisible people for middle class people. And uh, when um, that kind of protest happened, it was a surprise, uh, su surprise moment for middle class people. That, that happened in so many people in d those areas. Just, where, it was like, where, where the people were? Oh, what co kind of place is that? Because, because of the poverty in the uh, villages and uh, climate change, many people move from villages and small places to slum area, and slum area uh, hasn't, the improvement of slum area hasn't been uh, part, of, uh, part of policy to, uh, uh, to improve their condition. So they, they live in very poor condition. Uh, then you have had a student movement. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there are protests, but they are not connected to each other. Uh, and this, um, uh, the, uh, shutting down the, uh, the um, uh, plane, uh, created a moment for middle class to reflect. And why middle class? Uh, I think it's um, because those people who who were on the on the uh, on the um, uh, plane, he, they they were they, they are said that they are elites, and they were well educated people from Iran, some pro uh, professors, researchers, uh, doctors uh, that lived in uh, outside Iran. And for many people, uh, that, uh, many middle class people, that's the goal, their goal, that they, they, do, uh, they need to do, take good education, find a job outside Iran, uh, work outside Iran, and get a citizenship outside Iran. So when those people were killed, so made a kind of grief that their goals can end up in that kind of condition. The, even if you don't take part in any protest, in any political disagreements. So that's, uh, that's a reflection that will make more, uh, people more angry, mm. the middle class people. So now, uh, since Iran admi admitted that uh, they have uh, shut down the, uh, the um, Ukraine uh, plan, so they... Uh, there have been so many demonstrations, uh, and it started in, from Tehran, from uh, universities, uh, and uh, now you see it many different places in Iran. Uh, uh, and those who took part in the demonstration, they ask that how many other issues Iran have, the Iranian government has done, but they haven't confessed, mm -hmm. because they believe that Iran confessed that they have shut down the, uh, the plane because international uh, governments put pressure on Iran. Otherwise, they wouldn't know that. If those Iranians that were in the plane, they, were not, they didn't have dual citizenship. Many of them had uh, uh, Canadian citizenship and Canadian government uh, started to ask questions. So if they didn't have that kind of dual citizenship, they, wouldn't, they would never know what has happened. And now they ask question, for example, how many people were killed during the, same, uh, the demonstration in November? Uh, what happened in uh, 2009? So uh, that kind of you know, uh, reflection started. Uh, and um, the, you see, the, the, is, I, I think in general, uh, Iran, Iranian people are very sad right now and very angry. 
uh, you see many, uh, many uh, celebrities that uh, say that they won't take part in uh, Iranian celebration of uh, Islamic Revolution, which is next month. They won't uh, go to that celebration or uh, they won't work with Iranian national TV anymore because they don't give the right uh, account of or they are not accountable anymore. So the, in, the, you, that, that, the, the, the fact that Iran admitted what happened to that plan, so uh, created uh, um, uh, a moment that many people want to know more now. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know if I've, we have time. Yeah, uh, could you t just tell me the time, Knut? Uh, I forgot my own watch, so I have to... Quarter past. Quarter past. Time is moving way too fast. I have to ask you before we, before we sort of open up for questions uh, about a little bit about the power balance in the region now, because the downing of the plane was kind of a military embarrassment, I would say, to, to, to Iran. If you're not able to distinguish an outgoing passenger jet from an incoming missile, and that doesn't give you a lot of uh, credibility in, in military terms, I would say. And then you have, <coughs> on the other hand, you have the Trump administration, which you, um, again, said that, you know, he, he, the Trump administration, or Trump himself, has proved to be very um, unpredictable. So, um, and that's also something that his allies uh, are worried about, including us in the West. We're kind of worried right <laughs> right now, and I I can't help but wonder, you know, what would his Arab allies in the region think about that? And having that demonstrated on um, with the attacks on on the uh, Saudi um, oil uh, installation. Yes. <coughs> Do you see any sort of change to that whole dynamic in the region now? or uh? Well, we have seen a, a change since, mm -hmm. as I said, uh, as you said now, this kind of key moment was uh, when the build-up, uh, the increasing rhetoric of, um, of um, the um, conflict in, uh, in 2019, in the last year. And there was one that was, uh, as we remember, when uh, um, the Iranians had downed a, a drone, I think it was an American drone, and, uh, and uh, uh, American planes were actually in the air on the way to start a war with Iran, which bombing, uh, American bombs officially bombing Iranian targets in Iran is, of course, a declaration of war. And uh, um, Trump uh, stood down in the last second, apparently by a, just a whim, but it appears it was some generals who really was able to sit on his head and make him in the last minute to turn uh, turn around. But anyway, it showed that there is no control. There is no uh, control over American uh, uh, military or foreign policy. And then there was a thing I, I said when uh, Iran, <coughs> uh, Saudi Arabia had kind of uh, nudging, uh, not necessarily towards war, but at least to uh, s show force against Iran. Uh, and uh, Iran then officially didn't, and of course we nobody really <coughs> know whether they actually were behind the uh, the bombing of the oil facilities. But everybody assumed they were, so that we can take it as uh, uh, the political fact was that they were behind it, even if they weren't. And uh, uh, the U.S. only protested mildly. And this last thing, uh, the two together, but particularly the last thing kind of gave, apparently, the impression to, to uh, a number of the people, U.S. allies in, uh, in the Gulf, saying, we can no longer trust the United States. Kind of expression that NATO also, and um, Germany has said that mm -hmm. we must kind of think of, of ourselves. And of course, NATO Saudi Arabia by itself don't, can't survive in a war. Technically, Saudi Arabia has a larger military uh, budget, I think, than Iran. But I know that, I mean, they're shown in Yemen that they can't really use uh, their weapons. Uh, so they don't want a, an actual war without an American uh, backing. So what we have seen is that uh, uh, um, Saudi Arabia in the last half, uh, in the last six months, have started backtracking. They're starting to have negotiations with Qatar, which is an Arab country, but which uh, Saudi Arabia had tried you know, to to uh, picture as a pro-Iranian uh, stuff. 
And also they have, there, has, there are some movements towards low-level negotiations or meetings between Saudi and Iranian uh, things. So, uh, um, I mean, the conflict, the regional conflict, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran is still there. Uh, but they are dialing it down. Mm -hmm. They are saying that, okay, without the United States, without being trustworthy, a trustworthy United States behind us, then uh, we should be more careful. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is, of course, a good sign in itself uh, that uh, they are not, they're not, they don't know the, they can't push chess pieces across the board in the same way as they did before because they don't really know whether the queen in this case uh, works <laughs> the goes by their own goes by her own uh, rules without using the rules of the chess board. All right. Uh, I'd like to open up some questions on that uh, note. Any questions you might have? I'll take a couple of questions uh, and then leave it up to you what you want to answer to. I think there was there was one in the back and one here at least. Let's start at the back. Uh, hi. Um, um, don't you think that uh, this uh, conflict, actual uh, killing uh, Soleimani and then reaction by Iran and uh, that, that uh, event actually helped both sides to, uh, to both powers in American power and Iranian power to leave out all the internal problem, to be forgotten, <laughs> and people focus on other things. Um, um, for instance, um, Iranian get more power basically in Iran and in, in the region, get united against Americans to get out, and uh, also in America, impeachment was forgotten, and then in fact, actually, uh, killing Soleimani is a winning point for Trump, and uh, at the same time, helping his promise, campaign promise, to pull out all Americans, and this is a winning point, and then with the situation that we have now, they can say, okay, we have to pull out, we, we don't need to be there. And there was this question at the front, please. I would appreciate if you keep it a little bit short. Mm, just yeah, so. thank you. Um, so uh, we talked about, or you talked a lot about the regional and, and global and also like national uh, dynamics. But what I missed a little bit is like um, talking about regime stability because it surprises me a lot like how Iran maintains uh, like this sort of like massively resilient regime that appears, at least from the outside and as a non-expert, to not really respond to popular uprisings and demands for reform. Um, how, how do you see that happening? Like, what is the response from the regime to the uprisings from, um, from social movements, even though they might be quite diverse, actually? But what is there, uh, what can we expect, or how does the regime, or its, its, its parts, the political regime, the secret police, the, the religious um, aspects of it, how do they, will they respond to that? Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll need to answer uh, those two questions. Time's running uh, fast. Well, the first question about whether both it was, uh, you know, had the <coughs> effect of covering up internal problems. Um, <coughs> uh, for Iran, of course, Iran did not actually engineer the, uh, the uh, killing of Soleimani, but it was definitely until the, um, the airplane accident, it was really they who came out as winner uh -huh. because it did mm. stop for a time the social protests. Uh -huh. So it did lead to you know, stability. Uh, and uh, the major price was in Iraq. We haven't talked about Iraq today. Mm -hmm. But if at least uh, the, uh, the parliamentary decision to put you know, forcing all the foreign troops out of Iraq is not going to happen. I mean, it will stop. There may be some kind of, of scaling down or something for diplomatic uh, uh, things, but it was kind of. But the, the mere fact that the Iraqi government 
did not, not Americans did not pull out of Iraq, which is not Trump's fault, but that they were going to be kicked out by the Iraqis. Uh, that was, would, be, would have, was in itself a, uh, a prestige uh, uh, defeat for, for the US, and it would have been much more so than, uh, um, than if it actually is going to happen, which I don't think it will. Then if we were talking about Vietnam 1975, of uh, American helicopters leaving without having achieved anything. So, uh, um, so, and I don't really think there was really that much of a patriotic, you know, support in America for, uh, for the killing. I think, uh, the, I mean, apart from, you know, the hardcore, the Trump people, they, you know, the 30% or so who are behind Trump anyway. I'm not American. American politics isn't my thing, absolutely, but uh, 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 the, what we kind of see is more like a popular uh, feeling of danger of getting into another war with Iran. Mm. It's, not, it's not very popular in the States. Uh, but then the airplane accident happened and the protest happened and uh, everything changed. Uh, so, um, and we are still now in the middle of these protests. We, can't, we don't really know how it's going to develop. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going to die down, which whether the you know what you call the social protests, uh, people from the, mm -hmm. the slums, as you said, whether that they, they will start up again. Uh, as for your question on regime stability, um, Gilda probably <laughs> should answer that. From, from my perspective, uh, I, I think this what Gilda is talking about is the heterogeneity of popular uh, sentiment is important here. But because because we must remember that Iran actually has a kind of democracy. I mean, it, there are votes, very limited one, because only approved candidates uh, are, uh, are being allowed to put forward. But there is a kind of, of measurement of public mood there. Mm. And the government does actually, the regime does actually OK in most of these. Conservatives actually do win popular votes against slightly less conservative uh, candidate. And uh, that has probably to do with Iran being a very heterogeneous society. Again, I'm threading very softly here <laughs> as <laughs> Iranian specialist, but that in the countryside. And so there is really, a, 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 has been at least until the present, a genuine support for the regime, uh, um, for ideological reasons or for whatever reasons, uh, which is what is the government has been able to ride off the protests by the uh, by the middle class and uh, the more modernized sections of society. Would you like to add some final words on that? Uh, well, because note? of the uh, seemingly democratic uh, uh, structure, uh, for example, people have different type of uh, uh, local uh, local voting f uh, for common uh, common what is that called um, uh, yeah then uh, there is always uh, a feeling that you can do a change mm. within uh, the given uh, space that seems to be democratic so uh, there are many protests but also the structure is that in a way that you think you can do something uh, if you just enter into it and ask for uh, change, so so yeah. do, you don't think the, the regime is particularly fragile right now or vulnerable? I think it is uh, fragile because because if you look at how people talk about mm -hmm. uh, the condition that they live in, they they think that the, the situation is chaotic. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how, who take responsibility after each protest, shows that there are some disagreements mm. how the protest should be reacted to. Mm. So they not only feel disagreements in uh, the politics, for example, related to uh, corruption or uh, economic uh, pol uh, related po policies related to economy, they have also, they see kind of uh, disagreements in related to protests. Uh, so mm, because, of, because people s think they live in a chaotic mm -hmm. condition, there is a possibility that, uh, yeah, that uh, regime might 
uh, might be in a condition that uh, there are so many disagreements between mm. people. Mm. Uh, time's up, unfortunately. We have, uh, have tons of more questions I could have asked, but um, I have to leave it at that, unfortunately. But I'd like to thank you both so much for, uh, for joining and for, for helping us make sense of, of the current situation.